everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I should be the Sprint guy. Can you hear me now? He's not the Sprint guy anymore, is he? Oh no, he used to be the Verizon guy. Now he's the Sprint guy. That's it. He can probably hear me. I wonder if he's crafty. You think? Okay. Max is saying no. We've got about two minutes, I think. Two minutes. Max says one minute. So, what can I entertain you with? I know what I'll entertain you with. My not trip to China last week. So, as most of you know, I was supposed to go to China for a few days in the middle of last week, which is why we weren't having our class last week. <clears throat> and I went to the airport. Max dropped me at the airport. I'm in line to check in and think, oh, I should take a quick look at emails. And an email pops up from my factory rep over there saying, um, what do you mean you're coming today? The factories are closed for the next seven days for fall holiday. So it turns out there's not a lot of difference in the Chinese language between I'm coming on Monday and I'm coming on a Monday, right? So when I said to her, I'll come in uh, on Monday, we'll do, well, different day of the week there because of the time change, but we'll visit this factory on Wednesday, this factory on Thursday, and then I'll fly home. And um, she said, sure, that's fine. You can do that on any Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, which is not the same as this Tuesday or Tuesday. So I've learned something about not only about the language there and about clarity and being very specific about things. So the next plans that I make to China uh, will say on Monday the 6th or whatever it is. So it was, not, um, it was not that much fun to go to the airport and then to call Max and say, hey, guess what, come and get me. But it was a lot better to not fly 14 hours to sit in a hotel room for three days and fly back. So that was my story for that's my story for the day. Okay, it's time now. Max is giving me the thumbs up. Welcome everybody to challenge number five. And today we are talking about tools. And kind of the crazy thing about tools is they're no different than anything else, which is hard for us to get our brains around because um, we think, yeah, they're different. Punches are big and bulky. Dies are flat and easy to lose. There's this, you know, embossing folders are big and plastic. There's all this like type and style and construction of the tools, but the way that we're going to organize them is going to be very, very similar. It's going to, the same way. We're just going to adapt a little bit. So one of the things, oh, I need to backtrack for a second because I'm supposed to say at the beginning, if you're new, welcome. If you have questions, type the word question in all caps and Karen will be watching for that and answer those questions for you as we go, <coughs> as we go through the presentation. Um, we are live on YouTube and Facebook and live stream. Um, and all of the live is being recorded and it will all be on our website later in the day. Um, if you are new, you also probably want to join our Facebook group. We'll talk about that a little bit later. I think I covered all of those things, but I didn't cover our winners. So one of the things, new people, um, as you work through the challenge, you want to post up either on the Facebook group or uh, send us an email about your progress every week and that gets you entered into a drawing where you could win some fabulous prizes, generally a gift certificate, um, to the website. So the winners this week, we have two winners. Um, Candace Hall and her progress post says, here's the best progress post I can give. I'm in the middle of cataloging my extensive dye collection this go round. The cleaners are scheduled to come today. So last night I had to put away all my scraps, paper, bins, dyes yet to be cataloged, the whole messy project. Because of the organization via, via GOC, I've accomplished prior to this, the entire project was put away in two minutes. Woo! Neatly and with no actual disruption to getting the project moving forward again this afternoon when I get home from work. Thank you, Tiffany and crew. So that is one of the really cool things about um, getting organized the GOC way is that every task that you do in the process can be cleaned up and put away because we're working in these small chunks because we have a plan, because we have a system. So way to go, Candace! Congratulations on your prize. Second winner is Tanya Wol Wolfus. 
I don't even know. I'm slaughtering her last name, I'm sure. She says, I've enjoyed having an extra week for this challenge. I've completed sorting all my embellishments into categories. Yay! For the four-section system, they're labeled and in 12 by 12 Ziploc bags, waiting till I can afford some more pages for my scrap rack. And there's a, I, I don't know if this came out of Facebook, but she says, I found an old microwave cart to hold my scrap rack, so I have some storage underneath. It also has wheels, so I can pull it close to my desk when I'm working. So this is a great shit. There's a picture of it. So if it's not on Facebook, we'll try to get this picture up on Facebook. But I get asked a lot of times about, you know, how, is there a cart that I can put my scrap rack on? And this looks perfect. It has a handle at the end, so you could pull it away, pull it close to you, and push it away. So great find on the microwave cart. She says, I was also able to work some more of my family timeline, sorting another couple of years' worth of digital photos. Thank you, Tiffany and crew, for all the work you do to help us get organized. You're, you're also welcome. It's super fun. It's the thing that we enjoy most um, here is this process of helping people actually get organized, craft more often, have more fun, get more people crafting, get more people excited about crafting. Um, okay, ugly embellished. So, Again, and she gets a gift certificate as well, Tanya. And then we have ugly embellishment winners, um, Rhonda Bedsall and Denise Shearer. Uh, you are our ugly embellishment winners, and Karen will reach out to you with your prize for ugly embellishment. Today, since we are doing tools, I'm not sure. I don't think there's an extra contest uh, this week. Karen can correct me if I'm wrong um, in her notes and posts downstairs. But we're, let's get started talking about tools. Biggest challenge with tools is that they're all different sizes and shapes, right? So we have thick dies and stamps and punches and embossing folders. Um, so you're dealing with, a, unlike things like paper and stickers and die cuts that can all be kind of combined together in your scrap rack or in whatever uh, tool you're using to hold them, because of the bulkiness and the different sizes and dimensions of tools, we're kind of forced to figure out another way to organize them the same way as we've organized everything else. And the way to do that, the best way to do that is to create a catalog of all of those things. And I'm going to encourage you to do it all in one place. Now, one of the things I usually talk about in, in this uh, class is for people who we, we call you not, Nancy Not So Much. Nancy Not So Much doesn't have a lot of anything. She has a few stamps and a few punches, maybe a couple of dies. Um, and as the years have gone on, um, there are less and less Nancy Not So Much gals around, right? Most of us are Gloria got a lot. And so we have a lot of things to organize and a lot of things to keep track of. So um, I'm going to talk real briefly about if you are a Nancy, what you need to do <laughs> to uh, organize your supplies. And then I'm going to talk mostly about being a Gloria got a lot. My advice to you, Nancy, is to do a catalog anyway, because a catalog makes things simple and it combines them backtrack. Usually I say, Nancy, you don't need to do a catalog, right? You, you're just going to combine what you've got, representations of what you've got into your four section system. It's going to be very simple. But doing a catalog does a couple of things. One, if you decide to become a Gloria Got A Lot, um, you've already started the cataloging process, right? And then the other thing it does is it just puts everything at your fingertips. So even if your catalog is just two or three pages, as opposed to being you know, 50 pages, you still can reference those um, tools and products. So I'm going to really recommend, even if you're Nancy, not so much that you actually do the cataloging process as well, so that you can find those things quickly and know what you've got. So let's uh, start real basically with Nancy. If you don't have a lot of different tools and supplies, what you want to do is get those things integrated into your four section system. Um, if you're using a scrap rack, if you're using 12 by 12 storage boxes, whatever it is, you just want to put those things together. So birthday is a, kind of an easy example here that I actually have some birthday things right in. This is my actual section from my scrap rack. So let me just get to birthday here. Oh, go back. Nope, beach. Birthday, there you are. Now, I know it's always hard to see things because of the reflection from the paper. So I'll try to. But this is the birthday section of my um, scrap rack. And you can see these are all birthday embossing folders, right? I just put them right in. There's a little bit bigger one on the next page. Two pages back, I guess, right? So there's a 5x7 pocket there with a 4x6 embossing folder in it. 
but I've just incorporated those things right into my four section system. So when I go to the birthday page, I'm going to see all of those things that are for birthday. If I have things that are too big, like a wood stamp, right, I'm going to create a representation of that wood stamp. So this particular wood stamp is a bunch of gift boxes and I'm going to put it right in my four section system and I'm going to put a note on it about where that actual stamp is. So in this case, that stamp is in my um, stamp store and go bag. It's just numbered. But now when I look at birthday, I'm going to see everything that I've got. I also have this little, birth, this little package stamp right here, this little gift box stamp. It's just a um, flat acrylic unmounted stamp. I just put it right in my birthday section. So I'm going to see it, I'm going to use it. But I could also use that stamp somewhere else because it's just a gift box. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to make representations of that stamp and I'm going to write on it birthday. So when I see this in wedding or I see this in Christmas or I see this in new baby or I see this in graduation, I know that the actual stamp is in the birthday section, right? So as a, I don't want to put those in there because I need them next time. Um, so if you just have a few things, you just want to put them right into your four section system or create a representation of them. So when I see this, this stamp right here, if I want to use this stamp, I know I can go to my, my bag labeled number one and I'm going to be able to go to the shelf and pull that bag off the shelf and there's that stamp, right? So it makes it super simple to find whatever you need. Labeled on the side, number one, there's the stamp that I'm looking for, okay? All right, so that's very simple if you just have a few things. And we know that in our group, Nancy is far less common than Gloria. So let's start talking to you, Gloria, about, or, about combining all of those tools into one big catalog. The catalog that you're going to work with is going to follow your same four-section system. Of course, there's no rainbow um, in, the, in this catalog because there's no color. But um, you're still going to have alphabets and numbers, themes and sentiments A to Z, and the calendar year. And it's still arranged that same way. So this is my, ca this is my catalog. And the beauty of the catalog is that you are going to be able to represent your embossing folders, your stamps, your dies, your punches, any kind of tool all in one catalog by category so that when you're looking for birthday dies, you're also going to see birthday punches and birthday stamps, um, birthday embossing folders, any of those things because they're all going to be in one place. So you can make your catalog 12 by 12 or 8.5 by 11. I built mine in 12 by 12 because um, I keep it on the, in the center of my scrap rack. One of the questions I'm looking around, I think, Max, is there an 8.5 by 11 catalog on that cart right there, maybe under that big binder? Um, one of the questions I regularly get is, sh why don't I take my catalog pages for alphabets and put them in my alphabet section um, and put my Christmas um, you know, section in my Christmas section so that when I'm looking through Christmas, I see all those Christmas things? And you can. You can separate the pages of your catalog and put them right in with the four section system, especially if you're using um, a scrap rack and then you're just going to flip through and you're going to see them. You could put those pages, those catalog pages, if you're using the 12 by 12 storage boxes, right into the 12 by 12 storage box by that theme or sentiment. One of the things about keeping your whole catalog together in one place is that when you're adding to the catalog, the gift box, this little gift box stamp is a, is a, good, is a good example. When I'm adding to the catalog, this is going to fit in birthday, in baby, in congratulations, in retirement, in Christmas, in all of those categories. So I would have to go through all the sections of my scrap rack or all the boxes that might that these categories, that these things might fit in to add those examples to those boxes as opposed to going to one place and saying, okay, birthday, you know, flipping to Christmas and adding them. So it makes it a lot easier to add to your catalog for multi-category things um, if it's all together. Now, I know some people kind of do a dual catalog, and a dual catalog is easier to do if you're using 8.5 by 11. So they'll create one catalog. So this is the very, very first catalog that ever was ever done in, um, with 
It had punches. This is this is before dies. Punches and stamps in were represented in it. But it's eight and a half by eleven. So if you do your catalog in eight and a half by eleven, <laughs> the upside to that is you can take those catalog sheets and photocopy them, and then just throw the photocopies into your scrap rack or into your containers by theme sentiment. Um, holiday, whatever, right? So it makes it easy to duplicate your catalog. You do end up with double things, so when you add something new, you're back to the same thing of, of re-photocopying all those pages. The other thing about keeping all of your, back, I'm going to go back. <laughs> Max makes fun of me whenever I go back. Um, the reason I like 12 by 12 over 8.5 by 11, or another reason I like it over 8.5 by 11, is that you can just get more stuff on a page, right? So if you're talking about bigger things, bigger dies, bigger stamps, bigger stamp sets, um, you can just get more on a page. So, But the other thing about doing keeping your whole catalog together is that if you're shopping for something new, uh, alphabet stamps or Christmas dies or whatever it is, when you're online shopping, presumably online. Uh, you can look through your catalog while you're looking at things on the computer and then you're going to know, oh, I already have that or I have something very similar to that. I'm going to choose something else. So it really kind of helps you choose better when you're shopping as well. It makes it easier. It also is easier if you're going to an event because if you're going to go, if you do Stampin' Up! or Close to My Heart or Creative Memories or anything like that, you want to take that catalog with you so that you know what you already own. So again, you're not buying duplicates. You're buying things that complement what you've got. So um, I would say do a catalog all together in one, in one binder, in, on one spinder in your scrap rack. Um, and then if you want to double it up, use the photocopy thing so that you can throw those into your categories. But it is really simple to just go to the middle of your scrap rack, which is where mine usually resides, and flip to Christmas and flip through and see what you've got for dies or stamps or embossing folders, whatever it is. The other thing is, and you'll see as we go through this, um, that I use, I also use 8.5 by 11, right? There's stuff that you've heard me say before, if it's easy, it gets done, and if it's difficult, it doesn't. Sometimes it's just easier to add something that's 8.5 by 11 into your catalog. As an example, these are the, um, these are the instruction sheets for my a uh, couple of my punch boards, right? So punch boards are something that you generally need the instructions for. Again, they're a tool. You could easily forget that you have them. So photocopying the instruction sheets and putting them in whatever category you think they belong in, the ABC board, the flower one, and flower boards, whatever it is, um, just makes it that much easier and you're going to be far more likely to use them. It also reminds you that you have them and where they are. So you want to find a way to incorporate a reference to any of the tools that you are using or that you have into your catalog and that way they'll pop up for you and you'll remember that you have them and you're going to use them. So these are all just photocopies of stamp sets and then each of the little uh, notations on them is what tells me where they're, where they're stored, right? So these are unmounted stamps, acrylic stamps. These are woodblock stamps, right? This is going to direct me to where those stamps are stored. It's the same way that this little notation is going to direct me. So in this case, these are stored in, here they are, the whimsical alphabet uh, stamps stored in a double-sided stamp bag. One of the nice things about this is that I've got both the uppercase and the lowercase and the numbers all together now in one place. So these actually came, they are old Stampin' Up! Uh, stamps, and they came in these, guys, remember these, right? Well, if you have uppercase, lowercase, and numbers, you've got three of these boxes on a shelf. They don't stand up because they have like weird edges on them, right? So you got to stack them up. Then you have to remember that you have them, and then you have to pull them in and out, right, of the stack of them. So getting your stamps organized where you can put sets that go together all together is really helpful as well as opposed to having so many different options. But if you're keeping them this way, all you're going to do is give them, so Stampin' Up, you're going to give them a number, right? And you're going to write that number, like Stampin' Up basket number one or Stampin' Up one through nine, I think this is. 
you would just write that number. So where I put that, I, that they're in bag number one, you would just put that they were in basket number one. It's still going to drive you back to whatever storage tool you're using, right? So you have to totally reinvent everything um, to change that up. But it does help to consolidate them all down, and now I can get vertical on my shelf with those stamps, right? One other little trick, and some of you have seen this already, when you're using the stamp and punch packs, after you get everything arranged in there so they fit, if you make a photocopy of, of the tray and put it in the bottom, then as you pull stamps out and they get messed up, I mean these are easy because they're alphabetical, but, um, but once you, like if you pull out theme stuff and they get out of order, it's kind of like one of those um, puzzles to try and fit everything back in. So if you put that guide in the bottom, then you're going to be able to put all your stamps right back in to your stamp bag. Uh, pretty fast and easy. So, same thing with punches. It's going to work the same way with punches, right? So it makes it super simple to go vertical. Okay, so each of your themes, sentiments, you're going to do the same thing with. And you're just going to represent them. So first you're going to create your pages. Um, and you can see I've added some more. I put some more. Oh, so this is the instructions for my alphabet punch board, alphabet section right here. Um, and then it tells me how big they are and some of the guidelines for it, right? So one of the things we talk about, or we have talked about, is, um, is keeping things together you use together and knowing how you're going to use that. So if, you were, if the alphabet punch board makes alphabets that are five inches tall and three inches wide, you want to know that. Let me pull out my paper here, right? So if I just had this in here, like, oh, you have this alphabet punch board that makes alphabets, and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to, oh, that's perfect. I'm going to write happy birthday on this card. Well, it looks like that would fit because those are so small, but truthfully, they're five inches by three inches. So that's not going to work for most birthday cards. You would have to have a jumbo birthday card. So uh, that instruction sheet plus... This is the sample that came with um, the punch board, so it kind of gives me a really good visual on how big those things are. But it's right there in my alphabet section. So no matter if I'm making a, whatever kind of project I'm doing, I'm going to know how big those are, and, and then I have that, and I can use it. So especially if you're doing, if you do a lot of holiday decor while you're writing, or you're making banners that say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or pumpkin spice season or whatever it is, and you really want to see that, you want to use it, you want to know how big they are. So it's really an important part of the process. And then you're going to work through each of your categories of product. So it doesn't matter if it's a die or a stamp or an embossing folder, right? So these two pages are all embossing folders that are borders and backgrounds. And I just used a crayon to do a little bit of a rubbing, and again, the number that's on the square is going to tell me where I can find that particular embossing folder, right? So the key is to create those rubbings, create those punches, those stamps. So here's a set of dies, the nautical dies, right? Again, I have an example of all of them. They're in the beach section, and I can just go to the number that's indicated there and be able to just go right to that particular item. Now, different things are going to require different sorts of numbering and categories. So here's some dies. These are all Valentine dies. And B1, C1, that's going to indicate for me right here, that's going to take me right over to my die stamp, die and stamp file. There's B1, easy label, all the dies. I've kept the packaging so I know what it looks like. And with this particular set of dies, the dies actually punch out these little tiny hearts, right? And I just put that little, you could put this in your um, Valentine section, in your scrap rack or in your Valentine's box, but every time I punch those out, I just add them to that little bag there. So I've got what it looks like. Now here's another little tip. If you're using any kind of die pocket, um, the natural inclination is to put the flap towards the back of the pocket. But I want to encourage you I guess you could still do it toward the back, but I put the card in the front um, and then the dies in the back 
and the flap goes over the card. And that means that if I had little dies, they wouldn't be able to get out because the card prevents them from getting towards the flap side. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. All right. So the key to labeling is making sure that your label here is going to drive you to wherever those things are stored. So if you are using a die stamp and supply organizer and everything you have for dies is in that one place, then you're just going to give them those numbers and that's going to be fine. But you might have dies stored in two of these or you might be using a die stamp and supply organizer and a die file, right, where you've got everything else. Okay, so you want to be sure that you're representing die file. So this, these are all labeled in my, ca in my catalog, DF1, which is die file 1. All of those are going to be found right there. So when I go to this section of my die file looking for frames, let me put this back. So let's see, frames and shapes, here they are. I don't know, I need to. There's a couple of ways you can actually run them all through your cutter, right? Cut all those dies out and have that full size, colorful example, which is so pretty. Or you can just take a photocopy uh, or a picture of the die file and then put that in and, you know, just print it on your printer. The problem with this is that you don't have any idea how big those dies actually are because obviously this picture is significantly smaller than the actual thing, right? So you don't know. So one of the options is then to label your illustration with the widths of each of the, <coughs> of each of the dies. And I just use the outside dimension on this one, right? So it's faster and easier to take the picture, but you don't um, get the actual size of your die, stamp, punch, whatever it is that you are categorizing. So that's kind of the, the toss up. But this then fits easily into an eight and a half by 11 page protector as well. So you can slide it right into the, the pocket that way. I just put it in on top of this for this. So you can also, when you're doing um, the full size, um, the full size dies, you can also label each one of them. This is two inches, six inches, four inches, whatever it is. So you do have that, that actual size there. In the situation where we're talking about shapes, yeah. I do strongly recommend, especially for things like squares and circles, that you just write what dimension that is right on there. Because if you want a one inch square or one and a half inch square, one and a quarter, whatever it is, it's easy, like you can kind of eyeball that and know what size it is, but this way you're going to definitely get the right size the first time. This is punch number 51. I'm going to go to the bag that's labeled for me. Um, I think it's 40 through 56, and I'm going to find that punch right there in that bag. So it makes it super easy to find whatever you're looking for. One of the challenges people have is putting everything together, right? Like, oh, shouldn't I have an embossing folder catalog and a die folder catalog and a stamp folder catalog? No, you should not. Put everything together because you want to see everything that you've got. If you're thinking, oh, I'm going to use this birthday stamp, and you go to the birth and you have just your stamps together, you might be missing out on a birthday die or a birthday embossing folder or a birthday punch. But when you go to your birthday section looking for that stamp or the location of that stamp, you're going to be able to find, you're going to be able to see everything that you've got and you're probably going to use more of what you've got. Okay, so cataloging is our big mission. Um, this week. And one of the other things that happens with cataloging is we get overwhelmed, especially for those of us who have a lot of stuff. So remember, you don't have to do everything this week. You just have to work steadily through the week and do a little bit every day or every other day, however you're going to budget your time um, to do that. One of the things I do want to say about taking the time to actually um, punch to actually use all of your things to create the representations is that you find out what things you have that don't work. So this is a beautiful die. I have tried every trick in the book to actually be able to use it. Uh, tin foil, wax paper, bouncing it on the thing. Uh, what are the things, what are we using to pull this? Weeding tools. It's 
even if I do this die and try to pull out the whole shape of it with a weeding tool, it just tears into tiny pieces. It's a bad die. It doesn't have sharp cutting edges. I don't know what the problem is. Not a die expert. But if you, when you get to try everything out, and this could be true for embossing folders or rubber stamps or anything like that, and things just don't work, that is an opportunity for you to purge that item out, right? It's difficult to purge something like this because you're like, that was expensive. That's a nice die. It should work, but it doesn't. Okay, so if it doesn't work, it's going to go in the garbage. Don't put it in the purge box and give it to somebody else or pass it along to somebody because it's not going to work for them either. Right, so something like this, I've been hanging on to this. For those of you who've watched this class more than once, you've seen this, um, this example given. I love this. I wish it worked. It does not work. So as you go through your things and you test them out, if they don't work or you don't like the end result, sometimes we buy a stamp that we think is great, but when you actually use it, it doesn't stamp clearly. It's not, you know, maybe it has like little ripples in the design work or whatever. You're going to know it's not good, and then you're going to be able to get rid of it, right? So you're not going to use it because it doesn't really work, so purge it out. Okay. I think that's it for like the actual how-to. So usually we have a lot of questions in this class. If you've got questions that haven't been answered, Karen's going to bring them upstairs. I'm going to take a quick look at my notes here um, and make sure that I kind of hit all the different things. Storage decisions. I'm going to talk a little bit about tools like I always do at the end of class. But one of the things about storing your tools just in general, you want to think about how you work, where you work, all of those types of things. So before you decide that you want something, something like the Die Sam and Supply Organizer is a great tool if you always work at home because it's visible, it's open, it's accessible. It's easy to take things out, it's easy to put things back, right? Super simple. But you have to have open shelf space, open desk space, or a spot in your um, little uh, companion cart to keep that so that it is, because it is open and accessible. So if you don't travel, then this is a great, this kind of solution is great. The dice file is awesome if you don't travel with your supplies because everything is right there at your fingertips as well. But when you're choosing your storage tools, whether it's for stamps or dies or punches or embossing folders, you want to keep that in mind. How do I work? Do I have a craft room that's always set up? Do I need to pull things off a shelf and bring them to me? Do I have to get things out of the other room? Do I like to go to events um, where I'm going to be crafting and I want to be able to take those things with me? In that situation, something that's you know more of a small binder base, which this is great for embossing folders or dies or unmounted stamps, that's going to work as well. So before you start choosing the tools you're going to use to organize your die stamps, punches, etc., you want to think about how you craft, where you craft, who you craft with, all of those things, and then make the choices about tools, which I will talk about at the very end of class. All right, Max, what have you got for questions there? How do you catalog stencils? They don't usually have a theme, alphabet, or calendar association. That is an excellent question, but um, here's the thing. They usually do, right? So you have stencils. They're snowflakes. That's a halt. That's winter. You have stencils that are Easter eggs. That's Easter. You have stencils that say happy birthday. That's birthday. Stencils of flowers. Those are going to go in flowers unless you are someone who thinks flower spring and then all those go there. Right? So stencils actually do have, a lot of them do have a theme associated with them, but if they don't, then they're generally going to fall into that same category you saw for embossing folders, which I like to call borders and backgrounds. Right? So these are um, things like dots or, you know, whatever sort of random design, zigzags, stars, hearts, that type of thing. So borders and backgrounds is a great place to put them. And again, with stencils, you can do the same thing. You can photocopy them um, and, and then just write the note about where they're stored. Um, one of the thing, one of my tips for organizing your stencils, regardless of what type of tool you're using, is that if you create a little pocket, I think I have one right here, so hang on everybody. Hang on, let me see. I think I saw some over here today, actually, with my little, yeah. So, how, whatever tool you're using to store your stencils, so these are our 6x6 six six pockets, and this is a 6x6 six six stencil, obviously. 
One of the things about stencils is the little, they get hung up on things because they have all these little cutouts, right? So if you just create, I just took a piece of white cardstock, cut it seven inches long, folded up that bottom inch. And now when I slide this into a pocket or if I'm sliding it into a pocket in my scrap rack, when I slide it into the pocket, um, it's not going to get hung up on the pocket and it's going to be really easy to pull in and out of the pocket as well. And the other thing about that is now I can put multiple stencils in one pocket because again they're not going to get hung up on each other. So I could take this little tab that said butterfly and stick it right on the butterfly one and then behind that I could put dots and behind that I could put raindrops and zigzags or whatever. I could put six stencils in one pocket using that paper divider so they don't get hung up on each other and fill the whole pocket with them. So this is butterflies. Depends how you think about things. Do you have an insect section or is that probably going to be in spring for you, right? So you're going to represent it in that section. But anything that's generic, dots, you know, any kind of random pattern, you're going to put that right in your borders and background section of your catalog. Next. Holly said, for all I have, this seems like an awful lot of work, and I would never have any crafting time. And Penny also said, I have probably a thousand stamp sets. Cataloging them is such an overwhelming task. What do you suggest I do start? Okay. This is the biggest challenge with cataloging, is that um, we ha if you have a lot of stuff, just the idea of getting it done is overwhelming, right? And that is the beauty of just doing a small amount of them at a time. So you can. So we're, the challenge this week is to organize one box bin drawer um, of things a day. Well, four of them over the week. So one every other day. Am I remembering that correctly? Let me check before I start giving out information that's incorrect. Glasses. I should have printed this bigger. Catalog 20 things a day. Oh, that's it. The pay for it. Catalog 20 things a day for the next seven days. That's 140 items over the course of the week, and you only have to catalog 20 of them a day. That's nothing, especially if you're using photocopy, right? You could catalog 20 sets of stamps using your photocopier, depending on how big the stamps are, in less than 20 minutes, right? If you put one set of stamps and ran one copy, one set and ran it, it would still take you less than 20 minutes to get that done. And the beauty of it is, once you start cataloging them, you have an instant reference to those things. So you're going to use those things more. So if you just work, start steadily working through your cataloging process, um, and you do a little bit a day, right, 20 things a day, and get yourself started, you're going to realize the value of it. And for those of you who are on, who've done this already, um, please feel free to chime in because I hear over and over again from people at events via email on the Facebook page. I was so overwhelmed with the idea of organizing my dies. I have so many, but now I use them so much more often. It was completely worth all the work of getting it done. So even if you just set aside a few minutes, 10 minutes of your crafting time to catalog a few things, that's going to help. The other thing is as you use things, you can catalog them. So if you're sitting down to craft right now and you're using a couple of different stamp sets, that's the time. You've got them inked up. So get your scrap paper, make some examples of those, add them to your catalog, make a note about where they're stored. So as you're actually crafting, you can be creating the catalog at the same time. I'm going to share something else with you. If you travel and um, to craft, so you go to crops or classes or weekend getaways or whatever, you can't haul all of your stamps, all of your embossing folders, all of your dies, all of your punches with you when you go to an event, but what you can do is take a catalog, right? So now if you're working on a project and you think, oh, I would, I'd like to spell out happy birthday um, across the top of this page, you don't have to take all your stamps, but you can look at the examples that you have and you can say, okay, I'm going to use stamp set number 401 when I get home and I'm going to add that. So all you need is your catalog and some sticky notes and then you can do 90% of the layout and when you get home, you can use your stamps, your embossing powder, your ink, all of those other things to finish that page. You have the benefit of all of your tools, but you haven't had to haul all of them there 
um, to actually get the benefit of using them. So there's, it is really, really, it is so worth it. Start slow and don't let yourself get overwhelmed with it, it because it is going to be overwhelming. I mean, some people just shut down at the whole process of it. It's the same thing with people who have stacks and stacks of paper. But once you start, once you do that small amount and all of a sudden you realize, hey, I can find what I need. I can get it quickly. I can get it easily. It, it eases the tension on your brain and allows you to continue through the process. So I'm not, uh, I don't believe that everybody's going to get all of their um, stuff cataloged in this, in this week. And some people have been on board of the Get Organized Challenge for a year and just work steadily through. But once you get it done, then anything new that comes into your collection, you add to your catalog. And now you're going to be able to use those things much more often and much more readily. So it's totally worth it. Start slow, but start now. What else have you got, Max? What about stamps and matching dies? Stamps and matching dies. Matchy, matchy. I love matchy, matchy. Max will tell you that. So you want to keep your stamps and matching dies in the catalog together, right? Here's the stamps. Here's the dies that go, the dies that go together. Okay. So they're right there in there in your catalog and then you can store them together as well so if you want to put your stamps and your dies together in a stamp and die pocket I don't know if I have any in this uh, organizer right here but what I do have looking um, you can do that too so this um, this actually is stamps and embossing folders stamps and embossing folders. I just took <laughs> I just took a piece of our magnetic strip that goes on the die uh, file and I stuck it on the pocket. So this is upside down so the, my things are coming out which isn't good. But um, but I can I have both of those. I'm going to turn it around so it's not upside down anymore, right? So now I've got my dies and my stamps and the embossing folders that all go together, right? And there's the dies that go with it. Okay? Here's another little trick. I don't know if you saw this. Um, I, I had this with me when I was on Home Shopping Network uh, with this. Look at these dies, right? Do you have any idea what they say? Do you have any idea what they look like? No, you have no idea. Well, I made, I did a photocopy for the catalog of, I cut them all out. Then I laminated them. And then I just store this right over the top. Right? So I know what those dies say. Okay? So I can see, because this, you, you can't tell. You have it's so hard to figure out what they say. But now I know which die is which. So I took a photocopy of this and I put it in my catalog. And then I just leave the, um, I just leave that over the top. And I did the same thing with some sen other sentiments dies from uh, Sarah Davies, Crafter's Companion. Yeah. So I've got this panel here that's all sentiments. But again, it's difficult to see what those sentiments are. I just cut them off the packaging and did the same thing and laminated them, right? So I guess that's one other little tip. Anytime you're working with an embossing folder or a die or a stamp or pot, anything that has some sort of illustration on the packaging, before you throw the packaging away, you might want to think about, do I need that packaging so that I can, can I add that packaging right to my catalog or do I want to do something like this with it? Because when you, again, when you look at these sentiments, first of all, they're all backwards, right? And it's difficult to read what the words are. So doing something like this makes it easy to see what they are. You don't actually have to laminate it. You could just put them, you either photocopy it or you could just put them, you know, glue them on a piece of paper or something like that and then you'd be able to find them quickly and easily as well. But yes, you want to have the representation, you want to have the representation of your dies and the representation of your stamps together um, in the same place and possibly in other places. So if you had a situation where you had dies or stamps that um, could work in multiple categories, then you might also want to do that as well. One of the other questions that normally comes up is what do I do with, um, sorry, sorry I just put this in Cricut. Um, what do I do with, I put it in the wrong slot. That'll be a problem. Um, maybe I should put my glasses on. What do you think, everybody? There we go. Um, what do I do with stamp sets that have multiple things on them? Do I cut them all apart? I would say no. Just make multiple examples and put those stamp sets in wherever they go. 
most of the time when you have a stamp set that has multiple words or multiple things on it, they're all, they all have something that ties them together. So you might have a stamp set that says, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, um, Happy Valentine's Day, uh, you know, all holiday things, right? I can just go right in the front of your holiday section and or you can make multiple copies of it and put them in every one of the holiday sections in your calendar year, right? So you want to make it as easy as you can to get them into your catalog, so keep that in mind. How can I make this as easy as possible? And you also want to make it as easy as possible to actually find those things later and use them later. So if there are stamp sets that have multiple pieces that are going to work in multiple categories, you want to keep the set together, um, but just find a way to link things back and forth. Very similar to how we talked about if you, got, uh, if you buy kits that come in the mail, like how do you just drive yourself back to that kit? How do you find it quickly and easily? How do you link things together? You want to use the same process when you're creating your catalog. What else you got, Max? Um, you kind of just answered this, but stamps that fit into three or more categories, should you replicate them in each category, or should you just use the majority of the categories? Hmm. So the question, just in case you can't hear, because Max isn't wearing a microphone, um, if, if you have stamp sets that fit into three or four categories, should you replicate them into three or four categories, or just put the example in the major category? Um, I did kind of just cover this, which he also said. But if you put one, if you replicate them in all the categories, of course you're going to see them more and you're more likely to use them, right? Some of that is also going to depend on how big your catalog is and how much work you want to do and all of those things, whether you're Nancy Not So Much or Gloria Got A Lot. Um, then you can make that determination on a personal level. If you're just making photocopies, then I would say put an example in every category and you're far more likely to use it. It's just another piece of paper or another corner of a piece of paper or whatever um, when you're making that catalog and you can do it all at one time. So that is the beauty of as you're going through, you know, it's easy to say, okay, make four copies of this or, you know, I'm going to stamp this out four times or whatever it is like that. Sharon says, I have several six by nine stencils. Any recommendation on how to store those? I don't see any scrap rack pages to put them. Six by nine <laughs> Stencils, um, huh, six by nine, six by nine. I would say that um, double, if you're using a scrap rack, I would look at the P80, the vertical double. Those are six inches by 12 inches. And oh, what you can do is um, you can either make a long pocket, right? That is six by 12, so you can still grab the top of the pocket and pull up that small um, stencil. Um, or you can trim out the top of the scrap rag page, so it already has a cutout like this. You could make it deeper so it's easy to get that. The six by nine stencils are also going to fit in something like, um, like the 12 by 12, so we make a pocket like this that's 12 by 12, and then you could put them in that as well. And I think this might be a spoiler alert. Karen can answer it better than I can because she did the artwork for it, but I, I think we might have a pocket coming out that's nine by something on a scrap rack page. Karen will have to get the update on that for you, but um, you could also put them in, depending on what else you're storing them in, right? So if you used an eight and a half by 11 page protector um, in your scrap rack, you could probably do that as well. They're just going to stick out the top. But I would think that either the double, the vertical double is going to work fine, or you could use the 12 by 12 pocket if you're putting them, if you're keeping your stencils in like a fab file or whatever. Um, and, oh, you can also, you know, if you have a pocket like this and you want to divide it in half, you can either use a heat tool like um, the fuse tool from We Are and divide that pocket in half, or you could just put your hand in there with your tape runner and divide that pocket in half with a tape runner too and then you would take that uh, 12 by 12 pocket and turn it into two 6 by 12 inch pockets or whatever you need for that as well. But I would say the little insert piece is going to be key, especially if it's going to drop down low into the pocket. What else, Max? Two inch Martha stamps. <laughs> two inch Martha stamps. Uh, maybe Martha punches? Two inch Martha punches? I just read 
um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what a two-inch Martha stamp is. So whoever asked that question, if you, I mean, a two-inch Martha stamp. Oh, that, I think they were already talking about a two-inch punch pack for that. What's a two-inch Martha stamp? I think it's two inches tall. What oh. Actually, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. If you give us more clar clarity on the two-inch Martha stamp. That's going way back. So, so and I, I may, it may be a two-inch punch, because those are pretty big, but then the two-inch yeah. punch pack oh, is yeah, going to work great for those as well. All right, do you have other questions, Max? Yes. Okay. Um, I thought this challenge was going to be about tools like glue guns, heat guns, Sizzex, big stuff, not dies and stamps. Oh, this is always a challenge um, when we talk about tools like hand tools. So the question is, um, I thought this challenge was going to be more about tools like uh, Cropodile, Sizzix, Cutters, uh, that type of thing. And, you know, we actually don't have, um, we actually don't have a challenge so set up around that because more than anything that the question there is um, like how much space you have in your room and what's, how you're organizing in your room and if you're doing a, um, you know, if you travel with your tools all the time, then you want to keep everything in a tool bag versus keeping it in a drawer or whatever. But I will put some thought into, and if you guys in the Get Organized Challenge in the Facebook page or either via email, if you can email me and say, these are the things that I'm challenged with. I'm challenged with rulers or I have tons of paper trimmers or I'm not sure what to do with, you know, all my small hand tools. And even though I might not be able to turn that into one of the challenges, I could definitely um, go through and do, do a couple videos about different types of tool organization, um, people who travel with their tools, people who use them at home, and sort of some solutions for that as well. Definitely put some thought into it, though. It is punches, not the same. Stuff. It is punches, two-inch punches. That makes a lot more sense. So, um, yeah, the two-inch punch pack is perfect for that. Also, if you have open shelf space, um, this is a this is the four four level stadium arranger, um, which is wide enough to hold a huge variety of punches. I just have it turned over on its back, but something like but it's like this. Only this one's narrow. This one works for small like smaller punches. Will stand up in there. So if you have place that you can put out and view all your punches, the four inch. And uh, the four level stadium arranger is great for that as well. The punch packs work awesome for that. One of the challenges with punches and is just their sheer size, right? They're so thick. I absolutely love some of the We Are tools. Um, they, they have a big, um, they call it the square punch. And it's a big punch board. I love it for working with my planner. But the only thing I can do with that is put it on sh a shelf that's, so I, <laughs> My husband puts shelf holes in every shelving unit I have at like an inch or two inches apart so I can get my shelves super close together. There's a blog post called um, Space Wasteland and it kind of goes through that process of how, well you can even see up here, like right? So he, he puts holes in here so I could space these shelves exactly the height that I needed them to hold four by six boxes so I could fill that space left to right, back to front, top to bottom, the most efficiently. So with my big punches like that, we are um, square punch, <laughs> it's called. I have my shelves really narrow, and then I can park those punches in there and label the front of the shelf, and it's really easy to find them and use them. But in terms of putting them in some sort of storage thing, they just would take up the whole storage thing all by themselves. So there's kind of some challenges with that, and I can definitely address that um, when I address things like hand tools and um, paper trimmers and all that, so I'll I'll add that to my list. I'll definitely do a class in that. What else have you got, Burrito? Uh, what about frames, tags, and banners? Would those go in the shape category? Frames, tags, and banners. Uh, they could either go in. For me, I would put so my shapes category is shapes, and then within that, I have hearts, stars, circles, squares, um, frames tags, all that kind of stuff. So it depends how you think about that. If you think about tags, do you think of them as shapes or are you going to want a section in your catalog that's just called tags and you can go right to that section and see all the different tag things that you have. 
So where is your brain going to take you, right, for those different things? For hearts, I have hearts in my shapes category, but I also duplicate them all in Valentine's category. Because generally, if I'm going to think about I want a heart on something, my brain goes right to Valentine's Day as opposed to a shape heart. Um, so how, do, how is your brain process that information? Where are you going to look for that? One of, the th one of the really most important things about getting organized is understanding how your own brain works, right? And what is the most likely thing for you to find something. So if I say hearts and you think Valentine's Day, then that's where you want to put them or you want to make sure they're represented there, right? If I say eggs and you think Easter, flowers and you think spring versus flowers, nature, flowers, camping, flowers, gardening, right? Where, where does your brain go when you think flowers? That's where you want to make sure you have a representation of each one of those things. What else, Max? Is that it? All right, I think that's it for questions. So let's get down to what is your homework assignment this week, crafters? All right, you already know you are going to catalog 20 things a day for the next seven days. That's 140 things. And I want you to keep in mind, that sounds like a lot of things, but like I just said, you could catalog 20 sets of uh, acrylic stamps on your copy machine. Well, if they're small, you could do them all in one photocopy. Boom, you're done, right? Well, you got to put them away and you got to number them. But in just a few minutes, you could do that. So um, 20 things a day whether it's stamps, punches, and again, if you actually take the time to use the punch, to use the die, uh, to use the embossing folder, then you're going to find out how well it works and how much you like it. So it might provide you an opportunity also to kind of weed out some things that you're probably never going to use. Right? So uh, the next thing is if you're still sorting paper, you need to sort four more inches of paper this week. I don't know why I keep taking my glasses off like I can see without them. If you're still sorting uh, embellishments, you need to do one more um, embellishment container. My son is laughing at me. Is that, that's not very nice, is it? Okay, put your progress post on Facebook or you can send us an email. So remember, if you want to get in the drawing and win the prize, you just have to tell us how you're doing, right? Being, uh, going public and sharing your progress is really good for your brain and it really helps you stay motivated and focused and get things done. So share your progress. You might win a prize for doing it. And then last but not least, when you complete the challenge, you um, need to take advantage of whatever you chose as your reward for doing the challenge. So make sure that you're doing that as well. So I will talk just briefly about a bunch of the different products that we make and I'll show you a few of them but basically everything we make is designed to hold some sort of a tool so more importantly and I kind of talked about it already during class is what kind of crafter are you how do you craft where do you craft are you constantly taking things with you or do you always only craft at home if you're Kathy Craft Room, you always only craft at home. And so you want to choose things that are open, accessible, easy to get to, that you can take things out and put them back quickly and easily. So in, in that situation, if you're always crafting at home, you want to have things accessible. The DeskMade um, series of products is designed specifically for that. It is not designed to travel. It is designed for people who work at home. So take a look on the website at the DeskMade product line, the die stamp and supply file, obviously unmounted stamps, embossing folders, dies, they're all going to go into this as a little filing system. So this not only obviously will it sit on your desk or your shelf, this fits in the companion cart, um, which is the little cart we make with the pull-out drawers. This also fits in the Raskog cart. So if you're using the Raskog cart from Ikea and you're looking for a better way to maximize those spaces on the Raskog, uh, a, couple <clears throat> a couple of the desk made items might be a perfect choice. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, if you are looking for to being, being able to put things on a shelf, obviously the um, fab files come in every size and shape that's crafty, craft friendly. So the 4x6 fab file is a great way to store things like embossing folders and, sta <coughs> and stamp sets. Easy to label. If you have bigger stamp sets, oh, you can go with a 5x7 
as well. So this is, this is Stephanie Bernard. I've got dies and stamps, and I've even got her mini paper pads in there as well. So the fab files are a good choice, um, depending, again, on your shelf space and your accessibility, right? One of the design concepts behind the fab files is this is what I call the one-handed grab. Okay, so you can buy big boxes like this. They're made out of the same plastic. They're a little wonky. It takes two hands to get them off the shelf and carry them somewhere. And one of the things <coughs> I'm always trying to focus on is how do I get that with just one hand? How do I pull it off the shelf and get it to my workspace? So fab files, that's kind of their design concept is that one-handed grab there. Fab files are great. Um, Buddy bags, again, if you're taking things with you, buddy bags close up, they drop into your tote. So this one is loaded with um, our small die and stamp pockets. So I've got die sets in there. They just fit into the sections. I've also got, so I get to open the whole thing. I've also got the traders, the trading card size embossing folders those fit perfectly in there but this is just now a small file of die stamps embossing folders and again buddy bags are great close them up and take them with you leave them open on the shelf and then you have accessibility to those supplies when you're at home so depending on the type of crafter you are that's going to be a great option of course the um, flip and storage binders are perfect unmounted stamps dies Embossing folders are going to fit in the flip and storage binder. If you're using, if you're putting dies in your flip and storage binder, you're going to want to add the die stamp and supply or the die stamp and stencil pockets. So you're going to put your dies into this, and then you're going to slide them into the pockets of the flip and storage binder, and then you can flip through and see again all those die stamps, embossing folders. The nice thing about that is. You can put you can put the actual the embossing if you have embossing folders, dies and stamps that all go together. They're all going to fit into those pockets as well. Do the same thing with this or or these two, I guess, depending on the size of the stamp set or die set that are, those are all going together. Um, trying to follow along my list a little bit here. Of course, the punch and supply bags are you know favorites and have been forever since we came out with them. So this is the one inch punch pad or one inch stamp store and go bag it's called and that this is in backwards here's the front of the bag um, I just put it in the bag backwards so when I loaded it up I could put it on the copy machine make a photocopy of it and then as I kind of showed earlier in class this I put the photocopy underneath and so when I pull a few of those out and they get messed up I can see them all so my little now these are all eight and a half by eleven, um, the interior tray dimension, which means that if you're creating labels for them, so I just put my did a word doc in um, landscape to to label this, and then it just prints out the right length. And so if you're looking for a way to label, and then I just a little repositionable adhesive on there. So you've got the one inch um, punch pack. So here it is loaded with punches as well same thing it's just in there backwards I did the same thing with the photocopy underneath so I could see where everything went the double sided is two one inch trays uh, twice as much storage a single bag um, these are great because you can go vertical with them on your shelf to kind of create that library but they're also really easy to travel with so again knowing what kind of crafter you are how you move around in the world with your craft supplies is going to help you to determine what the best choices are for you. So the punch packs come in a one inch depth, which is this one. They come in a one and a half inch depth and they come in a two inch depth. And so there was some conversation going on earlier in the chat about the two inch uh, Martha Stewart punches. And actually, I think I have a few of them. Max, can you go around this? Um, unit right here on the floor about halfway down there's a punch pack with I think it has blue glitter tape around the edge of it large punches that's the one so this is the two inch punch pack and you can see I've got you can see kind of popping over the top there the jumbo Martha Stewart punches but I just um, I wanted this to be a little cuter, so I just wrapped it with wide washi tape in that um, blue. But 
And you've got these right giant Martha punches. So and even like this size or this size, they're all kind of in there. So those are good, the two inch punch packs, especially if you don't have shelf space where you can sort of line them up on a narrow sh shelf and label them. It's a good way to consolidate. Again, you can get vertical with those as well. Um, and then I talked briefly about um, using uh, the, the stadium arranger. So the four level stadium arranger or the six level stadium arranger, this is also a six level stadium arranger, but these are designed, these were originally designed specifically for wood stamps. You can see it just kind of pushes everything up a little bit so you can actually get a much better visual. So you're really kind of maximizing that shelf space rather than having everything at the same level. And then if you use a lot of small jars and bottles, it's great for that as well. Um, the, uh, some kind of basic tool stuff, the tool tower also part of the um, desk made line. So if you craft at home, it's a great way to store kind of your basic tools. These are punch boards. So again, the punch boards are funky, right? They have, they're not flat, so they're difficult to store. This is the eight and a half by 11 A4 fab file. And I use them on my shelf. You can see I have a couple of them here to hold funky shaped punch boards. And they just kind of create a nice neat little slot for those punch boards to slide in and out of. So I made a photocopy. I showed you that in my calendar. This is the pinwheel punch board, right? I made a photocopy of this and put it into my catalog. And then I've got some other accessories that came with it. And I'm just going to store them all in there. But it makes it really easy to get to that tool. So sometimes the best solutions are thinking about things that you have and how you might be able to, like this, turn it on its back, or like this turned on its back, like this turned on its back. If I change the way I'm approaching this storage unit, is it going to be a better choice for something else? Or is it going to work well for something else? So kind of keep that in mind as well. And then we also, um, on my list here and in your handout, there are some, um, there are the carts, the companion carts, which we are very, very low in stock on. If you, we have a couple of them in the warehouse. They're going to go live on the website this afternoon. Um, so if you've been waiting for a companion cart, we do have a few that came back in the trailer from our show tour, a couple companion carts, couple paper carts. All of those will be back in stock in um, January. So you'll be able to get those when we do our Get Organized Challenge, New Year's Resolution Challenge. Um, all right, I think that might be it, unless Max, oh, Max has a question. I have a couple questions. A couple questions. Um, so for open storage, like the stadium arranger and that kind of stuff, uh, are you going to make any sort of cover for that, like the scrap rack dust cover? Um, there's nothing sort of in the works for as a cover for any of these, no. Um, when it comes to scrapbook pages, can you put holes in them and add them to something like a notebook? When it comes to scrap rack pages? No, yeah. scrapbook pages. Scrap rack pages. Can you put them in a notebook? Um, you can, you can, they have it, scrap rack pages have a standard three hole punch. So any standard three ring notebook, which is what a spinder is, um, you're going to be able to put the pages on, but they're 12 and a half by 12 and a half, <coughs> actually 13 if you count from the edge, but from the pocket to the outside is 12 and a half. So unless you have a binder, which we do sell, a, it's called the 12 by 12 craft binder. It's actually on sale this week. Um, Unless you have a big binder like that, the pages are going to stick off the side of it. So if you want a big 12 by 12 binder, go to the on special page on our website this week. And I believe, since you're GOC members, you can use your GOC discount on top of the sale discount of anything that's on. I think we're doing to bags, totes, and travel accessories. And I believe that 12 by 12 binder is in there this week as well. Max has given me a look like we don't, but we do. Yeah. And, okay. um, and then when you're using a storage tool like that, 
Do you, would you catalog as you put things in it or once you were done filling it up? Actually, there is a blog post about this exact thing and uh, we'll include a link to that either in the follow-up if it's not too late or on the Facebook page. So any of the tools that I'm organizing with, the first step I'm going to do is I'm going to label each section and then I'm, then I'm going to add to that section, right? So I put A, B, C right here and then when that's full, this has movable dividers, right? So depending on how wide each section is, then this is going to be D, E, F, G, H, I. And then I'm going to add those labels as I put things in there. But I am going to pre-label the major thing. The same way like th th this is pre-labeled, right? Flip and storage binder, 1 through 30. This has 30 pockets in it. The first thing I did was 1 through 5. That's the first page. 11 through 15, 16 through 20. And I labeled the pockets. So when I put the embossing folders in the pockets, I already knew what the number was that I was going to add to that embossing folder and that I was going to put in the catalog. So great question. Yes, number or letter or whatever you're going to do first, depending on, I guess, what it is. So with punch packs, you're def you're gonna, there's a whole video on doing stamps and punch packs too, but you're going to want to put them all in, number all of them before you label that because you don't know how many are going to fit in there. I know I've got 30 pockets in this, but depending on how big the stamps are or how big the punches are, I'm not going to know that that bag is holding punches 1 through 30 or 1 through 50 until I've got them loaded in there. Is that it? All right, Max is saying we are done with questions. All right, crafters, so don't let yourself get overwhelmed by the idea of cataloging your tools. All you have to do is 20 a day, 140 of them this week. And like I said, you can do 20 stamp sets in just a couple of swipes of your copy machine, and that's not cheating. Right, so that one of the comments I got last challenge was I felt like I was cheating because I got everything done in this quick, you know, ho however it lined up, it was fast and easy. I felt like I was cheating. It's not cheating, that is your goal. All you have to do is catalog 20 things a day. You could certainly do more, but don't feel like somehow you didn't get your work done because it was easy. Just be thankful that, hey, this was easy, right? All right, everybody, have a great week. Get 20 things cataloged. Do a little bit more work on your paper, a little bit more work on your embellishments, and don't forget to put up a progress post because you definitely want an opportunity to win one of our gift certificates each week. And definitely take advantage of whatever you assigned yourself as your reward for getting your work done this week. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.